Hey there! I thought I would start on a new series of videos. And I understood that people seem to really enjoy it when I talk about things other than pens. And I will still do pen reviews, so you have to have no worries about this. But I wanted to do something else. And I've been thinking for a while about what can I do, because another thing that people ask me about is, can you talk more about psychological stuff? Because maybe you don't know, but I'm, I'm a psychologist. Okay, I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm a cognitive psychologist, but I am a psychologist, so I know, I know some things about human behavior. And this is the idea I came up with. I, for a few years now, have had a fascination with Stoic philosophy. Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, etc. And the interesting thing about Stoic philosophy is that it is a type of philosophy that is very applicable to life. I don't like super vague metaphysical arguments, that is not my thing. I like practical stuff. And one of the most pragmatic Stoic philosophers was Epictetus. Okay, and Epictetus was actually a freed slave. His master broke his leg, so he, he limped. But he made it up all the way from a slave to basically be what we would call these days a philosophy professor, teaching philosophy, okay? He had a student called Arian, and Arian wrote down all of his lectures, pretty much verbatim, but there were eight books that Arian composed, the discourses, and only four of those books now remain. Four have been lost <clears throat> to the tooth of time. But one book is very interesting, the Enchiridion, and I just wanted to show you best you spell that, how you spell that, okay? The Enchiridion. Enchiridion is a little hard to translate, but it's, it means something like a thing that you carry around. So basically a handbook. And the Enchiridion is considered to be the world's first self-help book. And that's what's so fascinating. And the lovely thing about it is that it's short, to the point, and practical. And I read this translation of Professor Long. Uh, the book's called How to Be Free. It also translates parts of the, um, the uh, discourses, so the, the longer lectures. But here's what my idea was. In all of these videos, I'm going to read you the entire Enchiridion, okay? But in each video, I'm going to read you one chapter, and the chapters are very short. They're typically half a page or something like that. The first one is a tiny bit longer, but it's still not very long. I'm going to read you that, and I'm going to tell you what that means to me from a philosophical sense and from, from a psychological sense, because I have the feeling that that is something that, that appeals to a lot of my viewers. So, sorry for the long introduction, but let's get started, all right? The first chapter of the Enchiridion, and it starts with a beautiful sentence that I, I, I particularly enjoy. The nice thing about this translation is that it also has the original Greek. Ton on ton tamen estin ef imin, tadeuk Ephimim. Some things in the world are up to us, while others are not. Up to us are our faculties of judgment, motivation, desire and aversion. In short, everything that is our own doing, not up to us, are our body and property, our reputations and our official positions. In short, everything that is not our own doing. Moreover, the things up to us are naturally free, unimpeded, and unconstrained, while the things not up to us are powerless, servile, impeded, and not our own. Keep this in mind, then. If you think things naturally servile are free, and that things not our own are ours, you'll be frustrated, pained, and troubled, and you will find fault with gods and men, but if you think you only own what is yours, and that you do not own what is not yours, as you really don't, no one will ever put pressure on you, no one will impede you, you will not reproach anyone, you will not blame anyone, you will not do a single thing reluctantly, no harm will come to you, you will have no enemy, because nothing harmful will happen to you. Keep in mind, then, that you have to be highly motivated if you want to achieve such great goals, if you will have to forgo some things completely and postpone others for the present, but if you want both at the same time, 
the things that are really yours, plus prominence and wealth in addition, you will probably not get even the latter because of wanting the former as well. And you certainly will not get the former, which are the only way to secure freedom and happiness. Right now then, make it your habit to tell every jarring thought or impression, you are just an appearance, and in no way the real thing. Next, examine it and test it by these rules that you have. First and foremost, does it involve the things up to us or the things not up to us? And if it involves one of the things not up to us, have the following response to hand. Not my business. Okay, what is Epictetus getting to? or getting at here. I think there are a few points that he makes that are very, very interesting. First of all, the whole point of Stoicism as a philosophical school of thought was to think about and to give people the guidelines they need to lead a life of what they call evdemonia, a happy, satisfying life. And there is no nonsense in this. This is a very straightforward thing that Epictetus is telling us. He starts by saying something in the world, some things in the world are up to us, and other things in the world are not up to us. And what he gets to near the end is you need to understand that those things that are not up to you are not up to you to change. Right? Now, if you want to make this a little bit more formal, and now we need to get a little bit into uh, Stoic terminology, look at it this way. The Stoics would say something along the lines of, what is very important for a life of Evdemonia, a nice, satisfying life, is virtue. You must be a virtuous person, but they had a very specific concept of virtue. Look at some other philosophical schools of thought, okay? Take someone like Aristotle, apprentice of, you know, through all the way down from Socrates. Aristotle would say, very important for a life of evdemonia is virtue, but to be completely happy, you need other things as well. You need to pursue those things as well. Health, wealth, he even said good looks are important to lead a happy life. Now on the other end of the spectrum is someone like Antisthenes, who in itself, in himself, was also a student of Socrates. And he, his school was the school of the cynics. And Antisthenes would say, no, if you want to lead a life of evdemonia, you only need virtue. If you are a virtuous person, you will lead a good life. Remember Diogenes, that philosopher who lived in a barrel and Alexander the Great came up to him and said, is there anything I can do for you? And Diogenes said, yes, you could step aside because you're blocking the sun. Diogenes was a cynic. So you see this very clearly illustrated here. The only thing you need for a happy life is virtue. No health, no wealth, no possessions, no good looks, nothing. So on one hand we have Aristotle, who says virtue plus specific things like health and wealth are required for a happy life. And on the other hand, you have the cynics, like Antisthenes, who say no, you only need virtue and nothing else. And the Stoic philosophers, like Marcus Aurelius, like Epictetus, like Seneca, they took up a very special position, right in between these two extremes in this debate, because they said, yes, you need to be a virtuous person. If you are not a virtuous person, how can you lead a life of evdemonia if you're not a virtuous person? But there are other things in life, things that may not be within your control, but that you can still try to pursue. And they used a slightly confusing term for this. They called these things indifference. 
So it's a noun, right? An indifferent. And I classify these in two ways. There are preferred and dispreferred indifference. And these indifference are things that you can try to pursue as well, like health and wealth. These things are preferred indifference in the mind of a Stoic, because these are things that you can strive to get. Most people would want those things. But then there are things that are dispreferred indifference, things that you would rather like to avoid in life, like being sick or being poor. And here's the best part. The Stoics say, you can do whatever you want. Because look at Aristotle. He would say, if you want this life of evdemonia, you want to live a nice and satisfying life, you need to be virtuous. Okay, well, we can all strive to be virtuous, right? We can try to be good people. But Aristotle would also say, but you also need health and wealth and good looks and some other things. But what if you don't have good looks? What if you're not wealthy? What if you're not healthy? Then by definition, you cannot lead a life of evdemonia. And look at some people who are chronically ill. Is that terrible? Of course, nobody wants to be chronically ill, but some people who are chronically ill are extremely brave and lead satisfying lives. In my mind, that kind of refutes Aristotle, because he would say that cannot be the case. How can you be happy if you're sick? Wealth and health are important in addition to virtue for a good life. And then the Stoics say, no, evdemonia, this good life, a satisfying life is attainable to everyone. And if you seek to pursue health or wealth, in other words, preferred indifference, you can do that. The only rule is that cannot get in the way of you being virtuous. So if you, in theory, this is a completely theoretical example, if you would be sick, and you could cure yourself by saying, well, here is the life of my child, and now I am healthy, my child is gone. The Stoics would say, that is wrong. Because now you are doing, you're making a mistake. You're now pursuing something, your health, and it's at the cost of your own virtue because you're sacrificing your child. Now, obviously, this is a very extreme example, but I'm sure you can understand that there are things in life that you might try to pursue, but you might do that in a way that is not so virtuous. You can have completely unacceptable and unethical business practices just to make more money. And a Stoic would say, that is wrong. Having money is a preferred indifferent, but you are seeking to get that in such a way that it interferes with your virtue, and that means your life will not be one of evdemonia. You will not have a satisfying and good life. And Epictetus gets to this, right? He says it. Some things in the world are up to us, while others are not. And if you start to realize that, if you start to look at life in that way, some things get easier. You start to see that if something is not up to you, you may be able to still pursue it. Who doesn't want to have a great job? But if you pursue it in a way that is not in accordance with being a virtuous person, at the end of the day, you will not come out on top of things. Because you're not a virtuous person, so your life will not be one of evdemonia, and that will catch up with you. And I think, from a psychological perspective, this is a great way to look at things. If something is outside of your control and you're worried about it, then don't worry. It's outside of your control. And we're going to see if, this, if people enjoy this series of videos, I will do more. And we will see in the Enchiridion that this is a very common theme for Epictetus. If it's outside of your control, don't worry about it. What's the point of worrying about something and outside of your control. I'll give you an extreme example. At many altitudes, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. What's the point for me to worry about that? 
Is my worrying going to make the water boil at 80 degrees Celsius so that it boils faster and I can make my tea faster? By the way. It's not going to make a difference. Now that's a stupid example. But what about a very severe example? Something happens in your life. A bad thing. You lose a job. You lose a loved one. Losing loved ones is another thing that we'll come back to in this book. That's a severe thing, right? You lose a loved one. But it's happened. What is your worrying or stressing about it going to change in that situation? You've lost your job. Is that horrid? Absolutely. Who wants to lose their job? But worrying about it won't make a difference. And that is the very powerful argument that uh, Epictetus presents us with near the end, right? I'll reread that passage. Right now, then, make it your habit to tell every jarring thought or impression you are just an appearance and in no way the real thing. Next, examine it and test it by these rules that you have. First and foremost, does it involve the things up to us or the things not up to us? And if it involves one of the things not up to us, have the following response to hand. Not my business. If you worry about something that you cannot change, you're wasting your time. And it's not going to lead you anywhere. Now, it's very important at this point to stress that in the mind of a Stoic, right, some people think that Stoicism, after all, we use that term in everyday life. He or she is stoic or responds stoically to this situation. Some people think it means not caring. That's not what a stoic says. A stoic does not say you should not care about anything in the world. No, the stoics care deeply, in fact. But you have to know what to care about. And some things, to be fair, it's impossible to care about. If you cannot change a situation, and you know you cannot change that situation, why worry? But understand, and this is another theme in Stoicism, that it is not the thing that's making you feel bad. I'm slightly paraphrasing Marcus Aurelius, another famous Stoic now. It's not the thing that's making you feel bad. It's the thoughts about it. And you cannot control the thing but you can't control your thoughts about it. If you have lost your job, that really sucks. But it's just a job. I'm not saying it will be easy to find another job. Maybe you have to go on welfare for a bit. Nobody wants that. But it's just a job. What if you'd lost a loved one? What if you'd lost your own life? And I'm not trying to say something like, it could always be worse. Yeah, that's a bit of, I, I don't like that type of argument. Yeah, sure, it could always be worse, but it could be a hell of a lot better too most of the time, right? But that's not the point. The point is, take control. Take control of your thoughts. If you understand that it is not you being fired that makes you feel bad, but the way you think about it, you're in control. And you can try, and it may not be easy, but with practice it gets easier, I can tell you that from experience. You can try to change your thoughts. Instead of thinking, my life is now over, I lost my job, maybe I lost my identity, you could also think, there were a lot of things about that job I didn't like so much. I'm going to find another job. And again, that may be hard, right? It most likely will be hard. But you're in control now. It's not the situation controlling you, you're controlling the situation. And if you really want to split hairs, in a way, having a job is a preferred and different. Because you can only affect it up to a certain level, right? You cannot say, well, if I flick my light switch, the light turns on, that's a causal relationship. If I do this and this and that in the world, then I will get a good job. Unfortunately, that's not how the world works. So again, assess this situation in the context of indifference. Maybe getting a good job 
is a preferred indifferent and is at least partially outside of your control. And once you realize that, why worry? It's not entirely within your control. And getting a job, of course, is partially within your control. Let's make it more extreme then. Your health. Go to the gym five days a week. Only eat the healthiest food. Great. A healthy life. Tomorrow you may still die. If it's not from a disease, maybe a bus will hit you on the street. Who knows, right? So your health, that's a preferred indifferent too. It's within your control up to a certain level. And that you can worry about. If you want to get healthier, eat better. Exercise more. These are things within your control. But getting a disease, that's outside your control, isn't it? Then why worry? Nothing you can do about it. I find this type of thought enlightening. And to me, <clears throat> I can honestly say it has made a big difference. It has made a big difference in how I perceive life. How I deal with things that happen in my life. Because everybody deals with their own troubles, of course. But if you understand what is going on, and you look at things in terms of, is this within my control? Or is it outside of my control? If it is outside of my control, is it a preferred or a dispreferred indifferent? You're thinking about things. And then it becomes easier to catch your train of thought and say, wait, I cannot change this. These thoughts will lead me nowhere. I'm feeling negative, not because of what has happened to me, but because of how I'm thinking about it. And what happened to me, I can't control. But I'm always in charge of what happens up here, because this is me, and that I can control. Chapter 1, the Anchoridion. I would very much like to hear if you like this video. I also would like to hear if you did not like this video. If you have any points of discussion, leave a comment. Comments are indifferent too, aren't they? I cannot control them. Why worry about me getting positive or negative comments? That used to worry me, but it doesn't anymore because it's not within my control. And we'll talk about being offended at a later stage because, and, sorry, I have to smile because Epictetus has a beautiful chapter on what to do if someone offends you, okay? So let me know, did you like this? Did you not like this? Is this of interest to you? Is this helpful? Is it useful? Is it boring? Etc. Because if people want this, I will go through the entire book. Every sentence in this book is worth reading. So I very much like to share that with the world. And that's it. These videos are unedited, no intros, there's nothing. I keep it very pure, very simple, because we're trying to be Stoics. Huh? I hope it was useful, I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll gladly see you later. Bye-bye.